When CBDCs are fully rolled out, how do you think that impacts the value of digital assets, cryptocurrencies, that aren't the CBDCs? We as end users won't know what's going on. Like, we just use money, like, as, as it's normal. But the CBD aspect... Hello, everyone. This episode of the podcast is so great. We've got Simon Buckingham back in the studio, if you will, to talk about CBDCs and how the government potentially have made CBDCs just so they can basically eradicate all other crypto, taking our profits. We also get an update on the Binance thing and everything with CZ that's going on. And we talk about a range of subjects about crypto, the fascinating future of crypto, also timelines as to when all these things are going to pop off. I really think you're going to enjoy this video. Subscribe to Whales of Wall Street if you haven't already. But if you're here and you're watching, this information is really, really good. So keep it to yourself. Let's get into the video. So, so 2024 bull run. Yeah, that's, do you know? Um, yeah, and I'll, t I'll tell you why. It's a bit of a calculated um, philosophy around that, I suppose. Just from like the the elements of of things like the RTGS system, the new remittance system, which which technically launches next year, they 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 switch it on. It doesn't mean like it's it's fully capable or everything's going to be intertwined with it at that moment in time. But we we kind of knew from research before that around November 2025 um, would be the significant, like everyone has to be ready or done with it. And I'm talking about like the institutional level, the banks, etc. So working back from that, of course, there's the big CBDC spectrum there. Um, but if you think from that bull run perspective, trigger points, I think April, I think it's April next year is the halving Bitcoin halving event, which I think will be quite a significant moment in time. Now in history, typically there's like a two, three-ish month gap after those kind of events before something triggers in the market in that, that major upward trend. So obviously we've had some really good uh, upward movement in the last month or so across the board. Um, but then, of course, some very crazy news again, the last 24 hours or so re regarding Binance. And it's it's almost, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a black swan event as such, but some people are arguing that simply because, oh, it's typical. We have a bit of m movement upwards and then there's a, a crazy um, announcement like that. So going back to that calculation is, is kind of like we're still being suppressed slightly as much as possible, whether that's to allow the banks to catch up, because we know, and I know you've spoken about it before, this whole custodial service that banks will probably offer um, at least by at least 2025 coincides with all that mentality. And I think 2024, in my opinion, certainly towards like that third quarter, uh, maybe halfway or the third quarter would start signifying um, maybe that next bull cycle. And I think obviously we've got some detrimental indicators to to look and think about as in, in that moment in time as well. Obviously the, the new higher lows, as they say, and all the, the all these kind of like key elements that would normally stand out. And I just feel like the timing would be sensational. And if we do reach that November 2025 mark, it sounds so far in the future, but it comes around quick. I would anticipate that it's almost that narrative of buy the rumor, sell the news in the sense that when November 2025 comes in, there will be a mass audience coming in, you know, the likes of PayPal, et cetera, opening these services up, banks potentially doing that. Can you imagine the confidence and trust from the general public where they're like, oh, I've never really trusted the exchanges or crypto in general, but oh, the bank's doing it now. So therefore I must trust and have confidence in it, even though personally, I don't trust banks. Uh, but it's, it's that principle, isn't it? You know, 95 odd percent of the population of the world still don't know what crypto is, and that's fine. But as a service being offered to your bank, you get notifications on your phone saying, oh, by the way, guys, we now offer crypto. Everyone's going to be jumping in. And I think that's where that hype mentality comes in, like we've seen in previous cycles. And then obviously the drop down, the usual winter and bear again. So that's just my thought process around it. But it's these narratives, these ETFs is a big thing, the halving event. And then, of course, that narrative around CBDC launch and RTGS system as well. It's just in my head, it's just playing every day that that's how I feel. Yeah, they're, they're all they're all coinciding, mm. certainly. Um, and I, I, I agree with some of the things that you've said there about kind yeah. of, you know, when banks start offering these things, then the, the, the retail, the sheeple get involved as well, <laughs> because they're just kind of following up what the banks say. Um, yeah. 
and that they are the epitome of not early in the space mm -hmm. like like we are mm -hmm. um and as investors you know early in the space is the place you want to be yeah um but just to go back to the halve the halving thing mm -hmm. um I, w I wonder what your thoughts are because every time crypto has gone on a bull run, the stock market has reached a new all-time high at that exact moment when the bull run starts. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost down to, it's very accurate. Like every time it's happened, um, and almost down to the day when, mm -hmm. when, the, when the new all-time high for the stock market is on breakout, that's when the bull run has started. You marry them up together. Mm -hmm. um, but when you when you do that for the halving, like you said earlier, it's like kind of like two three months. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's not as accurate as the indicator that I've noticed mm -hmm. that has been basically hundred percent accurate. Yeah. So my theory is is that the halving isn't actually the thing that that initiates a bull run. It's actually mm -hmm. the stock market. Yeah. It just so happens that the halving always happens around that yeah. same time as well. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that? Because I, I, I feel I feel like people give too much credence to the halving. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's the exact point. Is like in in the real mindset, it would be that oh, the halving events happen. That's a significant event in Bitcoin in the sense of the whole market. So you would insinuate that that is the moment in time. But actually, if you look at the data in hist history, albeit that you know blockchain overall is not hugely long. Um, there is that kind of two or three month leeway. And I guess a lot of people give that protection for themselves to say, oh, we didn't say it was going to happen this day. But at that aside, yeah, you're absolutely spot on. And I think you can argue that, and I'm talking about like significant amounts of money here. Like as retail investors, we, we do the best we can. We have relatively good portfolios. And even the people that will come in in this next wave will have a good, good run at it. But those that have like a lot of money, like maybe billions of dollars or millions, they just shift their money where where the money moves to. And it's almost like there's three or four pockets of things that you could go into. You've obviously got like the pension side of it. You've got stocks, you've got crypto now. And these are all just areas where people go, cool, I've made that high point, but I still want to, I would still want this money to run. So a lot of people in the instance yeah. would accumulate crypto. They, they'd sell at those high areas. It's the traditional method of buy, <laughs> sell high, buy low, obviously. Um, but a lot of people would just, maybe stay static for a year or two and go, I'm just going to hold this money back and wait for that bull run. But the savvy investor or the people that have been doing this for years and years, maybe decades, know how this works and therefore go, cool, I've made a load of money in the stock market here. These events have happened in crypto. It's stabilizing more. There's regulation, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, that transition comes across to another market. And it's not always crypto. There's there's other areas of interest as well, commodities, etc. And I think that's where it comes from. You, you hit the nail on the head in the sense that traditionally that stock market anticipation of the, the all-time high comes there. And it's just literally that money transferring across into a new market. Not always at exactly the same time, but of course, transitional, that dollar cost averaging format. A lot of these big rich people will have their own brokers and, and their own people intermediaries working on that, not just them as individuals. They don't have the time. But it's it's very coincidental, that timing. And that's, again, to that point that I feel like the transition towards that end of 2024 is going to signify the area of interest here in the crypto market specifically and into that 2025 momentum. And every market always has a narrative. Every big spike always has a narrative. And we've seen, obviously, previously the NFTs, the gaming. I do, of course, believe that they'll have a good run anyway, like everything else will. We've had a bit of a stint of AI uh, towards the latter stage of last year or the beginning of this. I can't exactly remember. But then I feel like this next wave will be around that sort of CBDC, trade finance, the fact that regulation is, is, is on our doorstep. Um, and everyone's going to signify a lot more confidence and trust in this area. And I think... Those that were doing stock markets and perhaps didn't dabble into crypto will for sure be coming across now, now that we see more media attention around the fact that banks are coinciding with everything and the fact that also the exchanges that we do use or have access to are really being stripped uh, back at the moment in terms of personnel. I mean, there's crazy things like Coinbase, like pretty much most of the US government works there now. Like it's all just part of a transitional plan that or oh, we don't want crypto to run away too far. We need to get hold of this again and make sure that we don't lose arguably that centralization aspect of it. So I think 
that's like my pipeline in my mind and, and that orientation around what you just said about the, the time scales, the time frames of how money will shift in that period of time as well. Yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. it, like the, the halving is coming soon. That's mm -hmm. exciting just because, yeah. <laughs> you know, usually when the halving happens, the stock market's coming into new all-time high. That's They've usually gone together. Mm -hmm. um, I just... I, I tend to think that we're going to see, at the very least, some sort of alt season before yeah. what you're talking about. Um, I, I kind of think the bull run's already kind of started. We're in that, you know, we've seen the low. We're just building yeah. now. We're building volume at those levels, mm. um, that base. Um, I, I just, I don't, we don't know whether we're going to see that retracement or a full bull run right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's obviously many different outcomes, but certainly this Binance stuff doesn't feel like a black swan. Mm. Like, you know, it's big news, but it doesn't feel like no. a black swan event. Um, and I think perhaps that shows the strength of the, the market right now. We're like, what else can you do? Like, yeah. you can't really kick us anymore because we've already been down for ages. Um, so what's another kick? Like, <laughs> like no one really cares about that anymore. Um, I saw something quite interesting on on Twitter by oh, what's his name um, Jake at Caleb and Brown because Caleb and Brown have been hit I think pretty bad by the new regulations in the UK um, as many crypto companies have but he was noting how and I'll try and show a screenshot on here he was showing how even with this Binance news no one's really flooding out of Binance. Um, no. Like you look at the on-chain data, there's not there's not like fear of people like people leaving yeah. Binance, and so I, I just think it speaks to the strength that we all have at, down at these levels, and also I think people have just in general learned not to have assets on on exchanges. Yeah, you know I think it's you know how price gets baked in sometimes on on an asset or on the lead up to news. I think investors. Right now, at the bottom of a bear market, the people who are really here for the for the good reasons sure. have been here for the whole bear market, and have learnt that exchanges aren't the best place to be. So it's kind of our our hedges have been baked in over the bear market. So when something happens to an exchange, it's like, oh well, yeah, yeah that's what exchanges do, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. I think there's two components to it in the sense that you should always know that you're running risk regardless, like whether you're an exchange or you're, you're investing in general. Um, but I think this, this whole Binance narrative, of course, we've had FTX already. And I feel like if people were going to jump out of exchanges, et cetera, that would have been the time. And, you know, me personally, and I'm sure yourself as well, Lewis, like the whole ledger aspect or hardware wallet is, is very appropriate in these times. Yes, you uh, essentially put extreme responsibility on yourself to look after it. And I kind of like that in a way. Um, and I feel like me personally, there's there's probably like one or two assets maximum that I have on exchanges now. And that's purely because the, the ledger, I mean, I could buy a different hardware wallet, but the ledger doesn't support those particular tokens. So that's the only reason I've got them on there. But I feel like, like you said, I feel with even with the one asset that I have Binance and one on Qcoin, particularly and respectively, I feel like they're safe. And I know there's insurance you know, guarded around those as well. And I, I feel like, as I said, if with the FTX situation, if you hadn't have exited already, why, why are you going to do like so now? And, and don't get me wrong, the last 24 hours have shown a bit of a shift out of the market and arguably a lot of that um, liquidation, if for a better word, was coming from Binance. We could see that from uh, wallet transactions. But the point being is that, you know, we we already hit hard. The last you know twelve eighteen months have been hit hard for us all, and majority of us are at a loss. And I'm not I'm not sitting there going, well, how much worse could it be? And then that, that's down to everyone's personal thoughts and opinions and what they acquired their mindsets around the assets that they hold and and the monetary value. So no one can dictate what what personal decisions people do or don't take. But for me, it's like. I'm I'm not fearful of any of this anymore. Like that when I first started in crypto, I was like, oh god, the news. <laughs> but then like, yeah, you know, that that's that's shafted out of my mind massively. I I just laugh at it all now. But I feel like with the Binance thing, it was inevitable anyway. Like 
and it's not going to be the end of it. There's going to be more and more exchanges getting scrutinized left, right and center. And predominantly, it usually just comes from the SEC. Most cases, it doesn't really affect the rest of the globe because everyone else has kind of gone, yeah, you guys are cool. It's absolutely fine. But the SEC has such a prowess in the financial world, and that, especially from that securities element, everyone does take note, which is a bit frustrating at times with the fact that the rest of the world tends to just carry on. It's similar with like the XRP situation. SEC arguably was the only institution or organization that had an issue uh, with Ripple as, as a whole. Um, but in in the grand scheme of things, it's, ba it's back down to that narrative again. It's, it's like the suppression tactic um, and trying to shake as many people out or keep that price as low as possible it's speculation, but arguably like to allow more time for the banking systems to accumulate if they want to in drips and drabs. They can't obviously take huge chunks of money uh, all the time because it would be very noticeable. But there's that that just that principle that um, I feel like with our generation, let's call them generations, our generation of in investor group. Yes, you had the major early adopters way back in the early stages. Then you had a small group of people or relatively large now from 2017, 2020, et cetera, who are, who are used to this now. The only people that are going to be phased at this moment of time, as I said, are probably people that aren't in crypto yet or have dabbled in and out at the very last minutes of that last bull run and probably been scarred to an extent um, psychologically of what happened potentially to their money coming in at those late stages and, and losing significant amounts of money potentially. Um, outside that remit, I think once that once this bubble of crazy media and narrative has disappeared over these next few months, hopefully, all the crazy macro events going on around the world. Um, the other thing as well to mention is the inflation rates. This is due to essentially stabilize throughout the most of 2024, but the latter stage of 2024 will see the reduction in interest rates and inflation rates, again, coinciding with timeframes potentially for a bull cycle as more money becomes available i think these are the areas where people will just not worry too much about that because it's already gone it's already it's already come and gone and then we're all of a sudden in a regulated world of crypto digital currencies which we know especially the uk government from the events that i've been to recently that the uk commission are very heavily guarded on creating these frameworks and implementing them strategically as soon as possible so that's that's where i think we are with it all at the moment and and that that will pass. But totally what you said, I don't think it's a black swan event at all. I think it's just laughable to an extent, but it was also inevitable. There was no doubt in our minds that there was going to be some push. But what's going to be interesting is who takes that Binance role at the top um, and, and who comes in as well, coordinated, similarly maybe to how Coinbase have done it. Um, and given that extra protection and that extra control to governments, um, and organizations worldwide taking on these exchange yeah. apps for the future. Seems seems likely that they'll have someone infiltrate and control it from the top, for sure. Um, so I want to touch on, well, there's three topics I want to touch on. I would love to get a rundown of the Binance thing for anyone who doesn't know. Um, I've been kind of oblivious to news recently because I've just been focusing on everything uh, to do with my my life basically um could you could you update me and everyone on basically what's happened here with with binance and why it's a big deal or not a big deal yeah generally speaking i think it, it's all down to the narrative of a lot of these exchanges at the moment whether they're offering uh securities or just the way of their legislation in regards to things like the way they've been advertising things uh, or promoting certain areas of interest within their service um offering so uh, again, another prime example was obviously Kraken recently about securities elements. And the exchanges are very different to what they used to be perhaps a couple of years ago, where they tend to try and disregard things or or do a runner. Um, a lot of these exchanges that are big powerhouses like Binance and particularly individuals like CZ, who are obviously very influential in the market and the arena of crypto, essentially just revolutionary people, if you like, maybe the Steve Jobs of, of that industrial revolution in the crypto digital space. And I feel like um, there's there's been a lot of this coming from the SEC for these kind of exchanges that we mentioned before, where they're perhaps losing that control. There's too much control going to these decentralized platforms or these opportunities, money shifting away from our banking systems 
Um, and they're not going to like that. So I feel like there's a, a bit of a, a double double side of the coin to this narrative. And I feel like they are being kind of, what would be the words, scapegoated, if you like, um, as being powerhouses, exchanges around the world um, to easily pick on because they know that everyone pretty much knows who they are and they use them as examples. So one of the things that came out of this recently, this was before the kind of announcement for a better word of CZ potentially, if not already stepping down, uh, was this whole $4 billion worth of uh, monetary value that Binance need to now pay or be fined uh, by the Department of Justice and the SEC in the US. Um, and this, this again is similar slightly to the Kraken situation in the sense that they were talking about how much money of or people's money was being used for certain areas of service, but also that whole aspect of how things were advertised and promoted to people. Now, we know that in the UK here with the FCA, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority, they are heavily guarded around this particular area and did do a shaft down of crypto a couple of years ago. If you remember, like tube station posters were going up left, right, center about cryptocurrency and join this exchange and that exchange. And it was clamped down. And even more so recently with the new rules and regulations, pretty much globally, everyone's kind of had to adhere to this. But um, I guess with those kind of like uh, situations where we've seen in the past where Google and Amazon may have got away with certain tax implications, particularly here in the UK and some other areas of the globe, there's always a way around it. And I feel like the easiest way around it is some form of fine. Just to say like, yeah, we understand what you've been doing but we want to make an example of you. So therefore, we're going to shove this huge number out there and then also accommodate the fact. And this is where I think it gets a bit suspicious in the sense that, hang on a minute, now we're shafting out either owners or founders or specific general people in these big companies as part of the agreement as well. And that's where it raises my eyebrows to think, hmm, hang on a minute, you're doing the fine, which is what you would normally do with a company in these certain situations, particularly from the regard of the SEC. But to remove people or you know, someone all of a sudden saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to step down. Why on earth would you do that when you're a multi-billionaire, unless you're, you've made enough money and you want to go away like Bezos did, um, and, and relinquish this massive organization that you've built? And that only turns to my mind that that was obviously part of the deal or an agreement in the behind closed doors. And essentially, that's where we've got to with it now is the sense that the owner of Binance, a very significant figure in the crypto space, CZ, is in that formality of, of removing himself, which is massive. It's, it is massive in the sense that it just coordinates everything that we just spoke about in terms of the other exchanges doing or having to do similar things. It's almost like it's not voluntary. It, there's something in the back end that we're not going to see publicly at all. But isn't it very coincidental that all these people are leaving left, right and center in drips and drabs, um, trying to do it slightly. But obviously, when you get to the magnitude of someone like CZ, it becomes very apparent. Um, and obviously, a bit of dominant news yesterday, which did tank the market slightly. So it's big enough for that. Um, but it, I don't think it's the end of it. I think there'll be more examples made, more fines made you know, scraping back a lot of money back into the financial systems that have lost a lot of money. We've got to remember, uh, certainly over the last five years, the amount, the magnitude of money that has come into the crypto space. Now, stock markets are, are slightly different because they are coordinated by banks. And that's why I think the crypto solutions will be coming to the banks because the banking system and the governments realize massively over the last five years how much money has shifted away. So they use these as examples. And before you know it, more people put their money back into the banks because they're scared or they start dominating and controlling the mechanism of these, what I would call databases of people with a lot of money involved, clawing it back into some form of formality within a centralized system. So there's, in my opinion, it's a massive coordination attack to an extent, uh, which has been going on for a number of years. Um, and I can see why they, they've been doing it because essentially crypto was scaring off uh, a lot of institutional level banking systems, which is why they're now all of a sudden scrambling to try and get this interaction with the ISO compliance, of course, with the RTGS, with digital currencies in general, and essentially potentially buying out exchanges or implementing people that will be able to manage the exchanges on the government or organization's uh, behalf. So 
There is a lot more to why Binance was kind of scrutinized in the first place, but there's a couple of modules there which mentioned, but you know, the suggestion there is, you know, ha have a look for yourselves. There's there's quite a lot of very big details. Some of it's probably not even public knowledge yet as to why this all fully came about. But those are some critical areas and certainly ones in my mind that stand out the most um, as to why we're in this position here and, and why it's so important as a narrative that works in their favor um, to either shake people out or um, start that, that momentum of just suppressing it enough for enough time to do what they need to do in the background um, and become the heroes of control and um, you know, the service providing that they'll do through these banks in the future. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the, the control is the key word. Hmm. Um, and that, and that's, that goes perfectly into the, the next two questions, which were with the, the UK regulations that came in recently. I made a video about it. I wasn't necessarily very happy about it. It, it felt like, um, and it's purely my opinion, and I'm going to get yours in a second, it felt like we were poised, it being the UK, to be like crypto friendly, a hub of the world, like crypto starts here. It's like, okay, Rishi Sunak, <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing a good job from the crypto side of things. Um, and, and I was quite excited for that. Then the regulations came in and I felt like it was like a bear hug. Mm -hmm. So it was like, it started like this, like, come here, come on, let's have a hug, crypto people. And then it was like, they turned serious and started squeezing. Um, that's how I felt. I, I don't like, I, I can see where they're coming from with the things like a, the timeout or the, the delay thing that you have. If you're new to crypto, mm -hmm. then you have to spend a certain amount of time yeah. waiting before you can buy or something like that. Um, what do you, what do you think about it? Does it feel like, it feels like overreach to me? Yeah, I think it was, it was inevitable, obviously, and the regulation framework is not fully completed yet, of course. It's something that will always continuously evolve in that sense. I mean, there's been a lot of laws going through at the moment, lots of acts going from bill stage to acts, as in you know, acts of law, around the utilisation of electronic documents or digital currencies overall. And yes, the UK was stabilising itself as the authoritative figure to pronounce that we were the first or certainly the the the, yeah, the first to market, as it were, for a better terminology, of of being them to action those kind of areas, and I feel like the rest of the world. Uh, it was it was quite ironic actually in the recent uh, trade finance day that I was at uh, with the TFDI. Um, they rightly mentioned it was I believe it was the UK Commissioner of the Law was mentioning that the UK is always seen and has been for not necessarily millennia but certainly centuries as the coordinated factor around the world of finance. Um, and whatever the UK does tends to be followed by the rest of them. And that's not a situation where the UK has gone and done this and then everyone needs to catch up. Of course, you know, the European Union, uh, especially with the blockchain association that they have and everything else related to digital currency, they've been working on this for years just as much as the UK. I mean, it's not a click of the fingers. It's not something that's just happened overnight. Um, and, you know, there's arguments even with the ISO 222 compliance that goes all the way back to the late 90s. Uh, if you look back in the history of that documentation, it's just the fact that digital currency and CBDCs for that, for a better word or framework, was not a technological advancement at that stage. But it's still thought about that we would go down this path. So there's an argument to say it's always been on the radar. And the last few years have really represented the need for this this requirement of law. And you're right. Um I did a video probably about two or so years ago, or one of the first videos I did on my channel. I said Sunak would be the next prime minister. And I took that regard because he was part of the World Economic Forum uh, leadership program, as are pretty much most of the prime ministers and presidents around the world that are in action right now. And they're all uh, pro crypto. They're all pro digital currency and CBDC. So when I heard about the Innovation Hub launching in the UK in London, um, you know, heavily oriented around digital currency and blockchain technology and some other advancements of, of course, AI, et cetera, and IoT. That's when it clicked in my head. Sunak was chancellor at the time, and I thought, cool, that matches up with the theory now. And then, lo and behold, that happened. Um, and since then, it, it is exactly what you said. It's like everyone got quite excited, or those that were in the know or did that dot connecting already were insinuating that 
okay, crypto is coming now. But of course, maybe disregarded the fact that regulation still was a question mark at that time. Still is. There's still a lot of gray area. But what you will see is arguably a new economy growing here. You're going to get a hell of a lot more new jobs because of blockchain systems being built and created. And certainly from the law firm's perspective, there's some great ones out there. I'm you know, good friends with Gunnar Cook, for example, who specialize in web free uh, crypto orientation around law, law methods and regulation around crypto assets, and particularly at the institution level, how you use them, sell them, buy them, trade them, etc. So there's a whole new economy coming from this. And it's, it's kind of exciting in that area where a lot of jobs are being taken by AI at the moment and just generalization of the digital format that we've had for 10, 15 years now, the natural occurrence. But it gives an opportunity for a new wave of education and knowledge. And that's a big another factor uh, at the TFDI event was education is missing. And that's even at the high level. There's so many banking institutions or people at those levels that still don't understand how blockchain works or crypto works. Uh, and you think that's a bit crazy, but actually it's not because a lot of people don't start jumping in until there is regulation, until there is a substance to say, are we okay to do this? Because we're going to be messing around with a lot of money and we need to be law abiding because of the company that we are, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, it, it wasn't a surprise to me, but it, it did it did feel like probably from the outsider's perspective that, oh, this is going to be great. But then, oh, you didn't tell us this was going to happen. And all of a sudden it's going to be more difficult for me to obtain assets and this, that and the other restrictions on how much we can spend or buy, whether it's daily, monthly, whatever. And you could argue that it's almost in a similar pattern of where where gambling comes in. Now, they don't really stop you from gambling. They just put out some nice messages saying, you know, gamble responsibility uh, you can put limits on there now etc cetera, etc cetera. but you still have the power to pretty much do what you want you can go to a casino and do what you want as well but with crypto is always an issue um so there's a bit of a, a dilemma there a bit of swings and roundabouts in people's minds as to like what's actually going on here but um yeah as we say it's, it's inev it was inevitable it's not finished yet and i do think there's gonna be a lot more stringent control methods um, and arguably maybe slightly harder in the near future for us to do that. But this is where digital identities take a big advantage point, um, especially if you're investing in crypto assets or utilities that um, operate in that area. It's going to be a, a significant advancement over the next few years, especially with biometric implementation as well and AI. So, you know, all of these things accommodating in theory should make it easier for us to uh, you know, accumulate tokens or use exchanges or banking systems, whatever it might be, uh, as opposed to at the moment, um, we've got to give it a bit of time. It's frustrating and annoying sometimes. It does look like it's a hindrance or a barrier to us. But at the moment, they don't have a full answer, which is why there's all these minor or some cases major restrictions at the moment, because they don't know themselves. And equally, they have a duty to protect the consumer or retail investor and investors in general. So instead of us going mad um, and potentially losing lots of money and then going, hey, why isn't our government helping us here? Like they should have stopped us from being able to do this, it, even though it's your own responsibility to, to think and do this properly. Um, that's, that's why they're here at the moment. I do think some of it will lapse. But there is always something in your head, the skepticism about control methods. And hmm, we were doing a really good run on crypto the last five, 10 years, maybe longer. And now it's coming to a bit of a point where everything's been watched. It's obviously very transparent anyway because blockchain. But there's like that that element of are they helping us or are they actually just uh, is there a method to their madness that we are being a bit too skeptical about? So. I, I do think in the next couple of years, we'll see a bit of a, an ease off, for a better word, um, once all these other mechanisms kick in to KYC. Well, well the, the, the ease off might, might just be relative. Um, mm. And what I mean by that is they might not necessarily mm. ease off the rules, but as more people come in, the people who feel like I feel right now get more diluted with mm. people who don't know any different. So people who come in, they don't necessarily know that their i guess their sovereignty and independence and privacy is gone now like with cbdc's for example they don't necessarily know that because it's just a mm -hmm. cbdc um yeah I, I think it's it's often just hard for us because we were here the whole time and we've seen the change whereas all the newbies that come in they won't they won't know any different um so yeah that's why i would say it's kind of relative but i wanted to advance on that 
conversation of control mm -hmm. <laughs> and talk about CBDCs, mm -hmm. um, I guess it's a two pronged question and they're kind of different, but one of them would be, what's your feeling about the, what, what's your confidence level that it, some sort of universal basic income is on the cards? Um, and then, Second to that, which is a really different question, but I will forget it if I don't say it. Um, when CBDCs are fully rolled out and they're all, they're all being implemented, mm -hmm. how do you think? Oh, sorry, <laughs> how do you think that impacts the value of digital assets, cryptocurrencies that aren't the CBDCs? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they're they're really two interesting topic areas. I think first and foremost, you know, CBDCs in some areas of the world have been operating already for some time, um, not even just in pilot stage. You know, China, for example, has been operating this for quite a bit of time. In fact, there's a massive case study of how much money was tran transacted through their Olympics, whether it was last year or the year before, I can't remember. Um, and it was in the hundreds of millions through this digital wallet application of the Digital Yuan. Um, and there's more and more countries worldwide right now announcing their launches of CBDCs. So that we're going from these pilot systems to launches and you, you're sort of scratching your head thinking, well, if the UK was supposed to be this orientation of finance, why haven't we got ours out yet? And this, that and the other. And other countries, you know, um, it's not my place other than statistical information on Google to say what countries are bigger than others. It's just down to usual GDP stuff. But the, the grand transition is, you know, US, UK, et cetera, are in pilot stages. They haven't launched one yet. So there's a lot of, of work and ground to be covered here. Um, and the reason behind mainly reasons behind that is again, back to that point that banks aren't fully ready yet. We got the ISO 222 digital messaging service application very much rolled out already. Pretty much all banks are adhering to that. The RTGS system has to come into to play as well to actually fully launch and be able to use that. We as end users won't know what's going on. Like we just use money like yeah. as, as is normal. Um, but the CBD aspect, sorry, CBDC aspect is, is still being worked on heavily with these higher regarded countries, probably because of their financial capability and the level at which they need to operate. And there's so many moving parts of that. Um, you know, trade finance is an interesting area that I have a great passion for. Um, that in particular is still working its grounds through the electronic trade acts that have just launched and how that will operate with stable coins, how it will operate with CBDCs. Uh, but on that top level, um, whether people like him or not, David Icke back in the early 90s was talking about a universal currency, a universal, arguably a electronic controlled digital currency. How on earth he came up with that conclusion back then? I have no idea. Maybe he saw some ISO documents that we just mentioned earlier back then. Uh, but it's been on the cards for a long time. And in fact, uh, one of my dad's old bosses who I met recently at a Digital Pound Pound event, he, he was speaking ironically, and it was really nice to see him. But they were working on CBDC terminology or technology application late 80s. So the, again, the only reason it didn't come out then was because there was no real need for it in, in the world that we see today. So my thoughts and opinions on CBDCs in terms of that launch frame aspect, it does, in my opinion, coincide massively with that 2024-2025 marker. And I, I've always said that I think they will bring it out as the solution to inflation. The solution integrating things like AI and IoT for full algorithmic data of finance. That why do we have inflation and all these balancing acts of money when it could be eradicated with something that could purely just done on real-time data to never ever have that happen again? And I, I'm adamant that that will be the solution, the answer to the general public. And people will go, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, I love that, let's do that. Oh, by the way, you've got to download this digital app. Um, can't remember the company who got selected in the end, but we've been following that since last December in the UK, particularly we're talking about here, where they opened up to all the companies around the world who can build the digital wallet app for the UK people. And that process already passed through. They got the £200,000 contract and they're already working on that. I can't remember for life of me who they were, but the point being is that in this next year or two, there'll be a trial system for us to download this app and use it and use this CBDC technology. Um, your point about the basic universal income comes at a very interesting time as well. So this is something that has trialed through the World Economic Forum for many years. Uh, Africa, I think we're doing this a few years back, Canada, maybe a couple of years ago, that whole narrative around own nothing, be happy. 
Um, there were instances, particularly in Canada, where people couldn't afford their cars anymore, etc. But the governments could buy these um, and essentially off you. But you would then have to be paid you know, weekly with this money. But you don't actually own anything. You can still use them, but you don't own them. And it's a bit of a weird philosophy. Uh, but the most nearest to home to us at the moment is the fact that Wales have been trialing this, I think now for at least 12 months, maybe slightly less or more. And in the UK, um, I can't remember the exact number, whether it's 100 people or 1,000 people, something like this, are trialing the basic universal income system right now as well. So is yeah, it- there's one in, one in the Northeast and one in yeah, London. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So is this a replacement to our existing benefit systems? Remains to be seen. Uh, but it's certainly part of a, I wouldn't necessarily say at this moment in time, a control method, but essentially it could be um, of that instance of, OK, we can essentially eradicate all this. We can utilize digital currency. It can be minted. It's essentially out of thin air like pretty much money is anyway. So it's neither here nor there to the banking system anyway. But what it does, and again, back to the David Icke terminology, is once you have something uh, where you have a need for something, you have um, a dependency on it. When you have dependency, you have control. And this is where I feel like it could potentially be going down. Elon Musk has talked about base universal income for years. And then when you think about the AI terminology of everything, the job aspects of things where people are like, oh, I'm going to have a job in five, 10 years time. What am I supposed to do? Oh, it's okay. You can stay at home. Oh, you, know, you can still keep everything, but you don't own anything. And we've already seen snippets of that, like with shared ownership, held to buy schemes, et cetera. They're all part of that kind of narrative where, you don't actually own anything, uh, but you're going to. Yeah, but they're, money they're anyway. marketed in such a way. Yeah. to where it appeals marketing, to the retail. Exactly the marketing, the narrative around it. It's it's that pinnacle of it looks great, but it actually isn't if you read and look into it properly to an extent. And that's not always applicable to everything, but certainly in the long scheme of things, that is how it stands. So again, the timing is very coincidental in the sense you've got the BUI conversation right now in the trial period. You've got CBDC pilots right now in, in trial periods, stable coins for companies to be able to use with each other and not lose that fluctuation of exchange rates and fees, et cetera. Um, and then, you've, of course, you've got coordinations like the likes of XRP Ripple can be used for the cross-border payment. You know, all of these things bridging together at a very convenient time. And these pilot schemes, if you look through the BIS, um, you know, you know, frameworks for that November 2025 day. They're all still there. A lot of banks have this on their webinars and, and presentation decks. You can download publicly. All of these pilot systems relatively end in 2025 to say, this is kind of like your cutoff point. And, and you see these narratives around the world, oh, we're still deciding whether we're going to do a CBDC or not. They're going to do it, okay? Like, yeah. <laughs> they're not going to backtrack. Like, a lot of money is invested, a lot of time. The technology is already there. The framework's already there. It's just now aligning every system financially and trade worthiness across the world simultaneously in this period of time to those areas. And before you know it, 2025 comes along, we'll probably be using the digital app. Basic universal income will be a thing. Probably a four day week will be a thing. And then we'll also have the CBDCs on top because we've had so much panic and hysteria for the last few years about inflation and we're, we're sick and tired of it now. But by the way, guys, a CBDC is here electronic form of money, meaning that it can be operated by AI, IoT algorithm, and means that we will never have these issues ever again. Uh, but by the way, we can essentially view, program this money, potentially stop it. They say they won't, um, and I'm hoping they don't. But the argument is that the technological uh, ability does, in theory, allow them to do all these things that we don't want them to do with it. So... Yep. Question mark still, there's been public surveys and unbelievably obvious, well, not unbelievably, I'm not surprised at all. There was no public marketing around the fact that there was a digital currency slash CBDC survey to the general public for everyone to look at and ask questions, argue about things, have concerns. How many people live in the UK? Fair few million, if not a couple billion, whatever that number is, only 15,000 people signed the survey or did the survey. So you're telling me that probably 99% of the UK's population, just the UK we're talking about here, have no idea that that survey exists and probably have no idea that CBDCs are even a thing. Um, and what does that tell you about what they do and don't want people to know that's coming? That's why I get a bit irate and sceptical about it um, because of the way things are done. If it was that important, like any other law abiding 
uh, survey or electoral roll request, we get things through the post. We get emails, we get text messages, but we got zilch on this one. So that's why uh, I sit there and think there's a bit more to this than meets the eye. Yeah. Um, so if you're somebody who, and this will be the, the final thing here. Sure. Um, if, if you're somebody who doesn't necessarily care about the the technology and the sense of like, oh, how cool is it that we're going to have a CBDC? Um, what if you're someone who actually stands to try to gain something financially from this move? Why would you be interested in CBDCs if your mission was appreciation of a different digital asset? Hmm. Hmm. This is a really interesting coordination of, of something to think about here because I'm I'm always on the fence. I'm always open-minded. And I feel like with cryptocurrency in general, it's obviously a big risk, like any other market is, any kind of investment. But what I'm more questionable about is, and I'm not saying this will happen, but it's always in the back of my mind, always in the back of my mind somewhere, that in the near future, what's to stop them and say, well, hang on a minute, everyone was doing this in an unregulated arena, an unregulated fashion, by the way, we can track every single person's money that's been coming in and out of crypto because that's what blockchain allows it to do. And what's to say they couldn't just cut us off and say, whatever you made in the market, we don't care because you shouldn't have done it in the first place. It wasn't regulated. It wasn't law abiding, blah, 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 and stop us. And this is where the programmability of CBDCs come in. So there's that argument to be like, am I just wasting my time here? <laughs> uh, who knows what will happen? Hopefully that, that will never happen. But there's something in my mind that always thinks about that plan B, plan C momentum. But the the other point of your question uh, in relation to, you know, what, why, what should people be focusing on? Well, at the moment, I tend to focus on projects that are heavily related to the financial systems and people that are either powering a CBDC platform or a stablecoin platform as well. I mean, there's a narrative of so many, not necessarily directly that are powering a CBDC, but at least some of the framework. So, I know yourself obviously loved the XRP Ripple aspects. You know, Quant, of course, is a big one for bridging. You got Stella, who are very heavily orientated around CBDCs and stablecoins. I mean, there's so many. You can reel off a massive list of them, and that's that's mm -hmm. where I find um, the Zen in my head for the, those kind of areas of assets. I've I've moved away personally from like the NFT spectrum for a while. I mean, I still hold loads of stuff like that, but I'm more interested in that top level financial institution level orientation of assets and things that are heavily related to AI, IoT, the energy markets, uh, all these things that can become very automated and the utilization of blockchains can be significant. Um, so that's where I feel like there's potential winning aspect there in the sense that if you coordinate your investments, yeah, okay, you can go for the weird coins like Shiba Inu, et cetera. I'm sure they, they might turn into a proper branded um, you know, utility at some point for some company that's like Doge, maybe for Twitter or whatever, or X, whatever it's called now. All these things can definitely still happen. But for me, it's about that top level orientation. My mindset is now like, okay, I've done what I needed to do with those ones. They're just sat there, but I really need to focus certainly in these next few months, potentially before underrun does happen uh, to try and accumulate these areas. And that's where I think there's an opportunity because these, this is going to be significant um, in terms of, What's coming for CBDC, stable coins, the financial institutions, and it's who's powering these. And a lot of the time, they are actually using blockchains that we simply don't have access to. Hyperledger, as, as an example, which IBM, et cetera, are using significantly. But there are consortiums like Hedera, for example, where actually the likes of IBM, Google, et cetera, are on the consortium panel. So there's, there is still some edge way inwards for some of these areas. I do think a lot of those will be around for a long time, I think we'll lose way over 50% of the crypto assets over the next few years, whether that's regulated uh, orientation of them disappearing or they just couldn't sustain themselves. And people are just waking up to the fact that I need to be a bit more serious with where I'm putting my money because of all these things that are going on and where everything is going. Um, and I feel like that's where the orientation is. So that's where I feel like is the, the winning areas and why CBDCs play a good part in that. But ultimately, as I said, in the back of my mind is these CBDCs could also work outside of our favor in the sense that they do potentially either block us from using that in the near future or it just becomes um, obsolete and we just have to use this new system. And the point I've always made to people is 
long gone are the days of pitchfork mentality uh, of protesting and things. You can wave your banners, you can s sit in the roads all you want, whether it's um, coordinated, whether it's created by media, or whether it's simply people are just annoyed and doing it themselves. You will not stop. You will not stop the momentum of what is to come. That is the, the narrative that you can only throw out there is that you can argue, you can be against it as much as you want. They are way down the line of all this. And it's just, it's just a matter of time now. It's not a question of, oh, I don't like that. I think we should repent and uh, you know, go against this. What are you going to do? Because we've seen it in many evidence many times that if you don't abide or you don't go along with certain rules, you get closed down, you get fined, you get shut down. You get a bad representation of your company or who who you are as a person, so you can't escape this. And that's where you got the two pathways in front of us. I believe truly that we've had this decentralized party for a long time. I'm hoping that some of that decentralization continues, but the centralized aspect has caught up. It's now realized over the last four or five years the magnitude, the power of the likes of Bitcoin and what people have been able to do and accumulate certain amounts of money that has been taken out of the financial systems and being used as people want to use it. They don't like that. They don't want that, let's be honest. So this centralized power is coming into fruition significantly and we will have no choice because it will become law. It will become uh, acts of parliament, all of these things around the world. And this is where the dilemma in my head is like, what's actually gonna happen with our crypto assets? Are we actually gonna be able to use them? But for sure, I believe uh, those higher utility aspect tokens are always gonna exist because they will be needed for these frameworks. Yeah. Um, it would just be a question of the access to them, how much access, if not at all. And uh, yeah, just that orientation as well around, you know, will, will we be even completely shafted off it at some point? And that's not to say that's going to happen next year. I'm talking about maybe five, 10 years, who knows? But everything is coming whether we like it or not. Um, but right. we have an opportunity, whether it does work out or not in the near future, to take advantage of frameworks of asset technologies like Quant, Ripple, et cetera, right now, uh, and see if we can make some money off it that are gonna be orientated around what's to come. I, I you know, w one of the things I appreciate the most about when I get to hear you, hear you speak is how you're always able to deliver both sides of an argument. Um, and you do it in such a way where it's like, okay, you have, you have an opinion, but it's also like, this is the wild west. We don't know, and and I, I appreciate that, and I thank you for that because it helps reel me in as well sometimes because I can get carried away on the ripple narrative, um, and and that's not necessarily all right, right? You, you have to have a balance. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate that about about you, and I I do recommend, highly recommend that anyone watching this video who isn't subscribed to your channel to go and do so. Um, you'll get much of this, much information like this and presented in this kind of way on, on his channel. So please go and subscribe. Um, we'll talk a little bit off, off camera here, but I think for now, thank you very much. That was, Lewis, we'll do it again. It's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much. But yeah, keep, keep the open mindedness, guys. I think that's really important. Um, whether you're right or wrong in the end, it's you know, always a good bonus if it is right. If it's not, you learn from it. But the open mindedness is very important at this stage uh, because no one knows and there is no right or wrong. And I think that the more open minded you are, the more chance you have of winning because you can see both sides of the story. Um, sometimes decisions aren't always made uh, cohesively from that, that kind of mentality, but um, it certainly gives you a clear aspect of the path you might want to go down. So just have, always have a think about things before you do something. Thank you for watching the podcast. I hope it delivered on your expectations. So as you may know, we have the 1% Mastermind. It's flowing along really well tonight, actually, at 8 p.m. Actually, it's right now. It's happening right now as you're watching this video. We have a live Q&A with Kim Butler, and she's helping everyone in the Mastermind think about trust structures and tax mitigation and everything, all the way down to kind of borrowing against life insurance. So we've got huge amounts of value happening in the Q&A. You're going to be late to the Q&A right now, but if you do join, you'll have access to re-watch every single Q&A that has ever happened and participate live in future Q&As. If you want to hear more about the Mastermind, watch all the way through to the end of the video. But for now, from me, I'm done. Stay motionless, and I'll see you in the next one. Over the last six months, things have started to shift. 
And by a shift, I mean, over the last six months, more people who meet that high net worth individual status have been contacting, asking me if I can facilitate large crypto purchases, connect them with people in private equity. And I found, quite frankly, that I've been quite good at that. And as time has gone on, I've really realized that I can connect people with some fantastic deals, great investment opportunities, and provide solutions for people at that level that you've probably never thought of. I acknowledge that not everyone is a high net worth individual, at least yet. And so that's exactly why I've created the 1% Mastermind. Over the last two years of making content, I've seen one of the biggest demands and needs of the audience is to have a list of professionals that you can contact when this whole thing takes off. When all the money comes in, our portfolios are of high value, what now? What do we do? Who do we contact? There's also a group of individuals that want to improve and do business and network among other millionaires to be. Nobody in the digital asset space has ever seen anything like this. Wherever you are in the world, the plan of the mastermind is to be able to connect you with professionals, not only in accounting and tax and law and estate planning, but to connect you with individuals who actually understand the assets you hold. We know about this all too well. We call an accountant and you know more about Bitcoin and XRP than they do. And it's not just a directory of professionals that we're offering here. We also have unique investment opportunities for individuals, even if you don't meet the accredited investor requirements. When you think about diversifying your assets in the long term, you might be considering real estate, venture capital, private equity. You won't need to go over here to find a deal. You won't need to go over here to find a deal. It will all be housed in that one central location and you'll be surrounded by individuals that are on the same page as you and want the same thing, not just for themselves, but they want the same thing for you. In addition to all of that, we'll also have a library of content answering your specific questions. Not made for views, not made for engagement, but made specifically to add value to the library of content that there will be. As time goes on, the price of the membership will actually go up and likely will go up every single week from here on out. So join the 1% Mastermind today and I'll see you in there.